everyone joining us tonight as I'm sure many of you were busy today with remembrance ceremonies. We'd like to thank the McKinley family for accommodating us during their renovations. We typically have our meetings in the um, uh, reception hall across the way and they're doing some renovations so they were generous enough to host us in here tonight. Um, before we begin tonight I just have a bit of um, housekeeping and branch business. First of all I need to inform you that we live stream record our meetings um, and that en enables members who aren't able to attend us tonight to watch online. Um, also, if you miss something and you want to go back and watch it at a later time or something, a time that's convenient for you, um, you can just check out our information on our website about our YouTube channel that we use to do the live streaming. Can everybody hear okay? We, we didn't have the, um, the microphones and things, everything set up because the room's so small, so we thought it would be fine. Okay, great. Um, for those of you who don't know who we are, um, we are the Kent branch of the Ontario Geological Society, OGS for short. There are branches and special interest groups all across Ontario who are promoting and preserving family history. We have a branch information card that's out on the table that you signed in on. Um, and it just talks a little bit about us. It has our website, our Facebook group that you can join, um, contact emails for us. Um, we have a family history library that if you are, are unaware, um, it's a gold mine of resources. It's in the uh, chat, uh, uh, the Kent Public Library, Chatham Kent Public Library on the second floor. Um, we have volunteers that man that room, so the calendar is going around right now. Um, so if you are a, a branch member, and please take the opportunity to sign in a day to volunteer, um, because without you, we couldn't open the doors and uh, allow the public to come in and use that room. Um, we do have monthly presentations just like this one. Um, we try to do a variety of topics and presentations related to history and family history. Um, we do take a break over the winter time, so this is our last meeting until March of next year. With that being said, our March 2017 meeting, that's our annual general meeting. Um, that's when we come together and we kind of do an update of what the branch has been doing. We do our nominations. We try to, you know, encourage more people to join on the council. Uh, some people might be stepping down or changing roles. So we do that in March. Uh, we, but we also have a presentation that night as well. So the topic of that night's uh, presentation is going to be researching your French ancestry. And we were lucky enough that Val Butterfield is uh, um, offered to do that presentation for us. So your French family history and a bit of our annual meeting. Um, for the April 2016 meeting, we're actually, we actually considered, and we are going to do it, we hope, um, take, our, take one of our meetings on the road. So we're going to go into the community and we're going to visit another organization that also preserves and promotes family history. Um, so we made contact with the Chatham County Black Historical Society. So our meeting, we're going to go on the road to their facility and they're going to give us a tour of their facility and their records. So there'll be more information coming down about both of those events as we finalize things. Um, as I, we also support many um, partners in the community and we share their events. Um, the Kent Historical Society is having a meeting next week, November the 15th, at 7.30 at the Cultural Center. Their speaker is Patricia Weaver Blondie and she'll be speaking about farm women. So be sure if you're, you know, interested in that company, topic, their meetings are open and free public as well. Um, the Chatham Camp Black Historical Society is hosting a fall open house. So you can go and see their new facility. They've been working really hard and changing things up. Uh, November the 24th from 5 to 7. And speaking of our community partners and making connections, Colleen LeBay would like to have the floor for a few minutes to address a few things. Thank you, Cindy. 
So we had an overwhelming response to our library committee. We actually have 10 people who have volunteered to be on our library committee, which is wonderful. And we're working on a number of strategies to grow and promote our library. And I wanted to just talk briefly about one area, which is on outreach. That's one of our strategy subgroups. And what we're hoping to do, or what we plan to do, is to continue to develop partnerships with other organizations. We've already had a number of great partnerships in place, one with the uh, Chattanooga Black Historical Society, with the Ken Historical Society. But we're looking for those other opportunities. Do you belong to another organization that might be a great partnership opportunity for us? If you have any ideas, if you have uh, knowledge of an organization, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, the person that I would want you to reach out to is uh, Linda Patterson. She is our publicity, publicity chair, and she's also the lead of the outreach subcommittee. The other thing that I want to mention tonight is that as part of promoting our library, we're going to make use of our Facebook account and we're going to start sharing snippets of information, small stories, maybe from some old newsletters, but we'd also like to encourage our members to share information about your own family history research so that we can again promote our library. So listen, we'll be sharing some more information about that a little bit later on, but you can start thinking about that. And if you're interested, when we reach out, by all means, please um, reach back and share those stories with us. We'll pass it back to you, Cindy. <laughs> Thanks, Colleen. Let's see if I lost my spot. <clears throat> um, lastly, lastly, before we get to our guest speaker, um, we want to share a great promotion that OGS has going on right now. I don't know if any of you noticed the flyers on the way in. Um, I'm not sure in this room who likes to save money, but I like to save money. Um, 2017 membership, it's 50% off for everybody, current members, um, if you're able to bring in a new person. So all the information is available. Um, if you're a current member and you can find a new person to join OGS, you get the 50% off and the new member gets the 50% off too. Now's a great time to join as well because they will be getting November and December for free, so actually they're getting 14 months. Um, if you're not familiar with the branch or don't know a, a, a current member, everybody here that's a member, could you just put your hand up in case somebody is looking for a partner that they would like to. So anybody with their hand up is a member of OGS, and if you are thinking of joining for the 50% off, you can talk to them later on. So how much is the membership? $63. So it, would be, it ends up being $31.50. Um, that's for the OGS membership, and then if you decided that you would like to join a, a branch, they're anywhere between $5 to $12.50. So for example, Kent Branch, you can join OGS and then join Kent if you are so inclined. Okay. Any questions about that? I like to save money. Cindy. Uh, so you get fifty percent off for one. Do you get zero for two? There, we're, we're encouraging people to spread the wealth. Oh. Okay. So if you have another person that would like to join, then I'm sure you know another OGS member that would love, so love to have the fifty percent off. So we're just encouraging people to share the wealth. So if you know more than one person, it would be great if every member, current member, I got a little pat in the back to say thank you for belonging to us and to stay with us and just here's a little, you know, a little more incentive and they're trying to grow. You know, even if we just bring in a few more people, that brings us more volunteers potentially as well to work on projects at the branch. So uh, if you have any other questions, definitely you can talk to anybody that's, you know, uh, on the council um, and then we can hook you in the right direction to, to get you up and going if that you're so inclined. Okay, so tonight we are honored to wrap up the Remembrance Day celebrations with a presentation. Jerry Hine is probably known to almost everybody in the room, I'm sure, um, but likely his topic is not. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Jerry to come up and give an interesting presentation. I'm intrigued. <laughs> well, to begin with, I didn't know I was going to be the closer for 2016. <laughs> <laughs> the, the pressure's on. Uh, and I would just like to take a minute for a little plug to OGS. Um, Gathering Our Heroes, I curate the Gathering Our Heroes website. 
and we are in the process of adding a geological component to it. Um, one of the things we found is that it wasn't, it was originally just going to be a set of, uh, a website for military information about people who served in World War I and World War II. Unfortunately, we forgot that who our, who our customers are. Uh, and the customers are usually the great great grandchildren or grandchildren of, of uh, people who serve. And in an effort to uh, make it easier for people to find the, the right connection to the right uh, veteran, we're adding in a, a genealogical component. It's, it's not going to be great, it's not going to be expensive, but it would be um, Bill Smith, Private 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Perth Regiment, the son of, uh, and their list of the moms and dads, and then uh, their siblings, and who they married, and their children. So we're going to stop there. But we think over three generations, somebody should be able to figure out, yeah, that's in. It's always very. So that's, uh, <laughs> I'm going to start there. I, I'm going to talk to you tonight about something that has nothing to do with military stuff. Um, and um, you might after a while wonder why somebody's picked up on this subject because the subject didn't start um, where I thought it, it didn't start where it ended. And I would have never guessed that it would have taken that choice if I had known the beginning. Uh, just before I get into this, I'd like to introduce Nancy Yackel. Nancy is uh, a person who actually experienced what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, <laughs> but before I talk about the Japanese Canadians, I want to, and because this is Remembrance Day, the government of Canada today has a fairly good <coughs> opinion worldwide of being one that makes uh, refugees comfortable, brings them in, all of this good stuff. And I agree, that's wonderful. The Japanese Canadians were not the first people that went through the experience that Madsen's family went through. In 1914, when the war broke out, the Canadian government started to round up Lithuanians, Austro-Hungarians, and in particular Ukrainians. And I didn't discover that until I picked up a book about our park system. I find interesting things in particular places. Jasper Park, Lake Louise, all of those nice beautiful places out there. They were pretty much built or started by people that we interned for World War I. Not only just for World War I, which we don't know into 1918, these people didn't get out until 1920. They were mostly all men. Now, there, there was a camp that was men, women, and children. Most of the camps were just men, and most of the men worked on the building of Lovely or national parks from 1950 to 1920 when we got out. So I just want to say, I have to explain this to you because everybody thinks about that the Japanese Canadians were turned. And mostly that's because we, we remember what the Americans did. They interned the Japanese Americans in camps like Manzanar and all of those places in, in California. Well, when you intern someone, the government is responsible for their care, their housing, their food, <coughs> and cannot dispose of their properties. We made that mistake in World War I. We interned the Ukrainians. The federal government was smart enough not to do that in World War II. And we'll get into that in a little while. <laughs> I started out on a, on a really crooked path of getting from this story to where I started from. And, um, and part of this story is going to be something about these. For any farmers in the crowd, you know what that is. Um, and this piece of wood will have. Piece of significance to 
my car. I had gone to an auction and bought a box of stuff. I wanted the box. I didn't want the stuff that was in the box. The box was a pine box about this big and about this high and about this deep. And it said Liverpool England on the front of it and VG Pine on the end of it. I had no idea what that was about. But it was the right size for me to put my DVDs in. <laughs> and uh, I Actually, I didn't even bid on the bus. I had, I went on the sleigh, and I did get the sleigh, and I got, I told my wife, well, if you want to stay here, bid on that box that comes up, and I'll be happy. And she did, and I got it. And it was a, it was a house auction. And so we were run packing the going to this pile of stuff in the box, and down at the bottom of the box were two bags full of a man's diaries from uh, 1891 to 1927. Uh, a farmer uh, named Harry Smith, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Ridgetown, um, you, you go the other way from the uh, golf course on the same road, and the first house is what's left of Harry Smith's farm. Uh, he had two sons, and they couldn't decide who got the house, so they cut in half and half the way. So, anyway, um, in Finding Perry's diaries, I didn't know what to do with them. I tried to give them away to the Richtown Museum. I tried to give them away to Chatham, and they said, "Why are they in my paper?" I said, "Well, I'm going to take them and use them in the basement. I'll keep." And for years, we would occasionally take some of Perry's diaries out. This guy wrote something every day, including the day he died, not feeling well. That's all it said. That was that was the end of it. But in these diaries. And there was a whole lot of things that came up. It, it happened that I was thinking about what I was going to do when I retired. And I'd always been interested in history. And I thought, there's got to be some stories in here. And there, Harry just had little snippets of information that everyone's not here. He wrote, the Moser, Moser house blowed up today. <laughs> uh, a small pox at the Arlington. Um, it's, a, tr a train wreck, stuff like this. And, and I started to get interested in these things. And it happened to me, one that caught me was the smallpox one, because it was just about the same time as we had the czar, or the uh, flu epidemics a few years ago. And they were sending, it, it, took, it took the doctors that year, the same amount of time it took this Dr. Lake to find out about smallpox <laughs> from sending stuff to Toronto and that. So we didn't really improve that much. But anyway, um, one, of the, one of the other things that happened in this was uh, in 1903, he wrote, was, was the town today paid Mr. Bruin $3.20 to get a boy from the home? And the boy from the home happened to be Victor George Pine, which I found out it was a Bernardo kid. I have no idea what Bernardo kids were. Um, but that got me interested in finding out what Bernardo kids were. Uh, and I think we did a pretty good uh, uh, seminar at, at, at the library many years ago on, uh, on Bernardo and, and home children. So, um, in finding about it, Victor Pine, and he he was said he and his brother Howard would come from England. Uh, he was 12, his brother Howard was 13. Victor went to live with uh, Harry Smith, and Harry treated him really well. And Howard went to another farm that treated him so bad he walked back to Toronto going for another place. Um, and what happened out of that was I learned a bit about the articles and I learned a bit about that, and then I found out that he was also a veteran of World War I. And he was living in a boarding house with ten, well, nine other British boys. It was known as the English Boys Boarding House on William Street. And of those ten, six, went, six were killed. Ten were wounded. One came back whole. And the funny thing about him, he was number six, 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 six. Yeah, four sixes. <laughs> and he came back safe. And one kid disappeared. I, I found a border crossing into Detroit, and I think maybe he just was trying to avoid the war. He didn't come back. Uh, but 
all of this stuff started to come up, and then Victor Pine's brother, Howard, this is where the story comes out. This Victor Pine, and anybody know uh, about the road house of Eatonville? Falling down to prep and building on the side of the road. Uh, okay, it's still there. It, it, it's still there. Um, and uh, Howard Pine inherited that from Mr. Uh, Eaton, who couldn't pay Howard's bills. Uh, and uh, he ran the the roadhouse during uh, before the war, and but into the war. And lo and behold, this is in 1942. This is where I hear about Japanese Canadians coming in. No, it's your 44, excuse me, 44, coming to Kent County. So I had to find out about Japanese Canadians. And it was it's such an interesting thing that I didn't know anything at all about the Japanese in British Columbia. Most there were 132 Japanese Canadians in Ontario in 1944. In 40, when the war broke out with the United States, our government jumped right on this. Oh, they, they were couldn't have worked any faster because they made mistakes in World War One. They weren't going to do that again. And uh, there was about 23,000 Japanese Canadians in Vancouver, in British Columbia, that area, uh, when the war started at the Pearl Harbor, 6th of December, 41. Uh, 60% of them were born in Canada, Canadian citizens. But there's been a lot of pressure on the federal government from interests within British Columbia that wanted the Japanese moved out. That everything the Japanese Canadians tried to do, they eventually made it illegal. Um, they, uh, They, they passed the Mining Act that would stop Japanese people from working underground. They passed the Railroads Working Act that restricted the construction and maintenance of um, uh, railroads or anything to do with railroads to Japanese people. They could not work in sawmills, shingle mills, cut wood. Um, the Duff Commission in 1922 uh, imposed a 30% charge uh, on license fees for fish for fishing um, they couldn't cut wood if it was on crown land well anybody know how much crown land is in British Columbia that's covered in wood almost all of it um, and this is the on and on but regardless of what they have to do the Japanese natives were still prospering and, and they were still growing um, and finally the war came along and it gave the federal government the tool that they didn't have access to until the war started, and that was the War Measures Act. And uh, in one day, this would be a, this, somebody should pull this out of the government archives to find out how they did all of this much work in one day. They seized 1,100 to 1,300 boats and pretty much closed down the Japanese fishing industry, uh, Japanese Canadian. Uh, it was um, uh, the Maoris that uh, could have just stopped and search and arrest you for other reasons. Um, they canceled all of their insurance policies. They, uh, they had to be registered and carry identification. Um, and then the, 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 this text was the best one. They made a 100 mile exclusionary zone along the coast of British Columbia. No Japanese people could be in that zone. And almost all of them were then living in that zone. Now, this is where we get to the now I'm going to start to wrap uh, up. And you were Casey's part. Yeah. Um, Hastings Park was the old uh, 
agricultural part of the excavation grounds. And it was turned into housing for families, family units with younger children, right? Okay. Uh, the younger guys, they were separated right away. You always want to get the young men out because they're going to be the biggest problem. Um, and they rounded them up. <laughs> and this is Maxi Stevens. One of three men. So I think I, she told me. Now, I happened to be thinking about suitcases one day. Just this last week when I was thinking about this. And I thought, where do I see people carrying suitcases like this during World War II? People getting on trains with one way tickets. And that was all that she could put in, was what she could put into this one suitcase for her mom, your sister, yourself, your siblings, and her dad. Well, her dad had a forbidden. Matthew's mom was not well. And they were going to some place. They had no idea exactly where when you left. Didn't know you were going to New Denver. You did. You didn't know you were going to New Denver. No. No. So Maxie's dad decided the best thing that he could do was to take the cast iron stove with him. He could take 150 pounds. And I would dare say 150 pounds was pretty much all eaten up with the cast iron stove. But he wanted to make sure that when they got to wherever they were going, he could keep his wife and family warm. This is part of the box. I wish we had the whole box and we were within probably weeks of getting the stove. Um, Nancy and I were on our way to the, to the wish center. Right? And then, uh, we were driving down King Street East and we Matt said, oh, there's our old house. <laughs> I said, oh no, the still going in the corner there. But that's where you moved when you moved into this church. It's good. Just, and it was sold. And a for sale sign on it was sold. And I said, she said, I wonder if the stove's still in the basement. And the, probably the stove was still in the basement. I called her realtor the very next morning, nine o'clock on the phone. You got this house for sale on no reason yet. Can we go over and see if there's a stove in the basement? I said, there's nothing in the basement. We threw everything out. Now, that as far as I'm concerned. Is it something that belongs in the museum? You, you'll have a look at it later on. And very faintly on it, it's this chapel. And that was the last move. But I'll tell you the rest of the story. So, um, Japanese Canadians were families were sent to Hastings, uh, others were sent to work camps. Because they were not interned. They were moved for their own protection. So they had to pay to stay. Now, the only way they got paid was they had to work. Usually working on the roads in British Columbia. The, the families, like Max's family that went to New Denver, they were actually ghost towns that they repopulated with Japanese Canadians that were moved out of Vancouver. And uh, the guys who were supposed to work, they got the lobbies uh, some 25 cents an hour. And I don't know about you, but that's not a lot of money, but it might have been more money than 25 cents would buy today. But as most government things don't work so fast, um, they hadn't paid the guys for about three months of work. And they were shelling out their money, whatever they had left, uh, to 
couple of their growing board and peats and this kind of stuff. And these guys decided, hmm, well, if, they, if we're working and we're, they're not paying us, we can go on strike. And they did. And the next day, working very fast, a whole bunch of mommies showed up, arrested them all, took them down to the custom shed in, in Vancouver, left them there until the end of the war, and repatriated them back to Japan whether they were born there or not. That was the consequence of that strike. Now, as the war got on, um, the Germans were doing pretty good sinking ships out in the Atlantic, and we were getting pretty good at training guys and sending them off to uh, most of the Canadians all went to Europe. Um, we needed people to farm. And uh, who, who put their hand up and move this one? Oh, <laughs> this, is, this is my mother's. Her dad was a farmer of all. This is what she used to box sugar beets. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure why she kept it, but I'm glad she did. <laughs> um, so the bread that the bread ball said, mm, this is a good opportunity. We'll start to move people out of British Columbia. But they didn't really, they didn't really uh, have a good idea of how they were going to do that. And right off the bat, Alberta said, no, thank you. Uh, Manitoba said, no, thank you. Ontario really said, no, thank you. Mitch Hepburn was a pretty good man. He didn't want anything to do with that. They had enough Japanese, thank you, 130 people or 32 people, that was plenty. Um, and the city of Chatham was really against any movement to Kent County. Um, you think they said some stupid things in, the, in King Street West now. They really thought of some stupid things then. Um, <laughs> They were they were they were writing pages of stuff on anti evacuees coming to Kent County and why it was dangerous and some streets weren't going to be safe and they, they were rapists and what does this sound like? You just heard <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it, it was crazy and funny that the federal government said we're going to do it and we're going to stop them. Um, and for the most part, well, there were, it ended up that uh, for some of us in Ontario, uh, there, was a, there was a campus in Trillia, uh, one in Harwich Township, which is, the, which is the only one in the municipality of Chatham that you'll see this sign. Uh, and I challenge anybody to go find it. <laughs> it's on the Doyle side road. And, and uh, I wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, other than I told them where the, yeah, the place to put it is where, <laughs> where it is, but I would have liked to tell them something else. Anyway, um, the Francis Select Farm, uh, Rick Miller, uh, an old GS guy from, from here, uh, he, he was on the Francis Select Farm out in Dover uh, when they, the, the day that the Japanese Canadians arrived here. And uh, he and a bunch of his buddies had gone to Mitchell's Bay. I, I interviewed him, he was he had a great uh, way of telling stories. And, and he said, You know, we were out there, and he said, All of these sugar beet trucks started to arrive. And all of these people were getting out of the back room, and everybody just kind of stopped and they looked and they said, Well, which tribe are these guys from? <laughs> 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 now, uh, this is before the days of political correctness, uh, and, but they had been, I mean, 132 Japanese Canadians in Ontario, was a good chance you never saw one before. Um, and uh, uh, so there was uh, uh, one in Dresden, Dresden had, uh, they offered, folks in Dresden were really smart back in, back in the early days. Uh, the feds had approached them about having uh, a camp there because there was a sugar beet uh, 
plant in Wallaceburg and Lone Chatham, and that would that would be a good place to put the uh, labor. And the good folks who press this about, you know, gee, it's not that we're against this, but uh, if it had the fairgrounds, but there's no water there. Then the fence said, oh, no problem, we'll put a well in for you. <laughs> and, and Vic was, uh, was telling me, you could hardly find a part for a pump, let alone a whole pump at that time. And the fence showed up with these truckloads of stuff and they had a well drilled in no time. And then they said, well, there's one other thing. Uh, we had this fall fair, and we make a lot of money off of it. So we, we really need to get our fairgrounds back uh, for our fair. And I said, we'll find someplace else. Now, the other, the other camps were at uh, uh, Glencoe at the fairgrounds, um, Petrolia, Zalata, um, the old open bucket. Tourist camp. I have a picture of it. I didn't bring it. And this is where they're still not eating dill. Well, the problem that there wasn't now eating dill then was that it, this was in the summer when the guys came because they were there to do the cross. The Eaton Dill Roadhouse had students working in the, it was called the uh, Community labor program, something like that, uh, and you could you could work your summer, and they put them up at the at the roadhouse. But as soon as the fall came, they, uh, Howard Pine was down there. Said, you know, send me your Japanese down here. We'll keep them. Well, it was even more important for the feds by that time because the good folks in Chatham who wanted to restrict, the, uh, I shouldn't say the folks in Chatham, at least the elected folks in Chatham. They wanted to stop the Japanese from even coming into the town. If they were at the English, the Harold English farm is the one that's on the door outside though. Uh, and that was the biggest one. And, the, and the, that particular family was excellent as far as uh, looking after the, the men, boys that were there. These are mostly young guys in their early 20s. Um, uh, and uh, They, um, <laughs> they, they uh, were, were really to the point where they were getting sick and tired of the city, wanting them to be under guard if they came into town. They had to be out of town by dark. They had to do. They, they could only. They had to be uh, uh, only could come in on one day a week. Uh, and these were young guys. They were then. They said, "Hey." We're going to go on strike. Now, remember what happened to the guys that went on strike in British Columbia. So, this was a, just a case of not making uh, some money. Uh, this was a case that if the money showed up, you were going back to, well, the Fed said, you know, enough of this. Uh, you guys have got to smarten up. We need this crops done. You're going to stop this nonsense about what they can come into town and how they have to be buried and all the rest of this and stuff. Uh, and um, oh, by the way, uh, we run the country, not you, because they tried to say, well, okay, but the last crop that comes off this crop of fields in Kent County, those guys have got to be out of here. And of course, they're not being divided to say anything, but uh, that didn't happen either. As a matter of fact, when, when it came to closing all of the other camps, all of the other ones in southwestern Ontario, they kept one camp open in Kent County. <laughs> and that was the camp in Edenville. And they had the guys working uh, in Rondo Park and building sheds and stuff like that. And, um, so uh, the, uh, that was kind of the end of what happened. And finally, I got. Japanese Canadians and the, the Roadhouse in Eatonville and Victor Pine sorted out with Howard and all this stuff. Um, and at the end of the war, most of the Japanese that came here were gone. <coughs> but the 
the federal government had one last thing that they really wanted to do, and that was to reduce the number of Japanese Canadians in British Columbia. And they came up with a really nifty idea. Um, it's, it's euphemistically called the loyalty oath. That a Japanese Canadian family, everybody, mom, dad, kids, had signed. You have signed yours. Uh, and um, if uh, at the end of the war, or if, no, not at the end of the war, at the, their discretion, they would send you any place east of the Rockies and you had to go, or you would go back to Japan at the end of the war, whether you were born there or not. And as I understand it, that's a statement, was very good to do it first. That her dad said, not doing it. We're not going to sign this little deal. And they were transported from New Denver back to Tashman. Right. No loss of that. And Tashman was a, a, the last camp before we got on the boat. And as I understand it, uh, a, a missionary had been to Japan and came back and said, folks, you need to rethink this thing because the folks over there don't want to see it. And their rice bowls are not that full. And their countries were pretty much blown to bits. And Nazi's family decided that they would sign the one of the other and move on. Which brings us back to the board. Not knowing where we're going to go, Nazi's dad boxed up the stove. Put it on his back, and the first stop was Nays. And uh, Nays was a German prisoner of war camp up on Lake Superior. And, and uh, it was for, it was for, no, it was for Kriegsmarine, but not the submarine guys. The submarine guys they sent to Kananaskis because they wanted to get them as far away from water as they could. The other guys were okay, and the guys that were here in town, the prisoners of war during the war, during the World War II, that were here, they were mostly merchant marine. Actually, some of the guys went back to Germany and said, "I go back to that other country. It was a lot better than this one because it didn't all it wasn't all blown up." Anyway, box the thing up, take it in the days, ends up in Chatham. No, days it. You went to Toronto. That's right. Stengo. That, which was the um, RA, RCAF bombing school during World War II. Um, and boxed uh, up the stove, moved to Finko. <laughs> Finally ended up in Chatham, Boxed up the stove. And took it to Chatham. So this piece of wood with a cast iron stove in it went almost all the way across the country because this man wasn't sure of what he would find wherever he got. And I think that makes this a pretty valuable piece of wood. Um, the War Measures Act was finally lifted uh, in '47. I have to talk to you about this one guy. Um, he was uh, he was a veteran of World War One, um, and I would I would be hazard to guess the how to pronounce the name, and I'd mess it up anyway. Um, but uh, like any other soldier from World War One, you could get a land grant at the end of the war for veterans, and he did. And he went out and he farmed his, I think, 25 acres to start with. Um, as immigrants often do, you get another 10 acres here, another 10 acres there, and invite some more of the relatives over. And by, by the time they took his farm away from him, it was valued at almost $30,000. He picks a nice name in the the open up valley. Well, after he was uh, let out. 
He wanted to go back and see what was left of his farm. Now, the last War Measures Act to be rescinded in 1949 was the act that said Japanese Canadians could not return to British Columbia or they would be arrested. This veteran went back and they arrested him and they sent him back to Japan in 1948. But the last act was the one that incarcerated Japanese Canadians for a whole long time. The 132 Japanese that um, were in Ontario before 1941 turned out to be 6,000 after 1949. And um, I think from anybody that's been around this area, it turned out to be model citizens. Um, so that's kind of what I think the story is. Howard, Howard Pines, Eden Dolo House, uh, came into the story. Victor Pine was killed in 1915. Um, Harry Smith died in 1927 after a day of not feeling well. And it just seemed to that all of this finally came together in one great big thing about a whole bunch of different things that had nothing to do with the first thing that I started off looking for in this, in this book. Um, Nancy has uh, some pictures here and some information. If you're interested, I brought some of mine. Um, uh, I don't know. Oops. That's probably what they saw the first the first day that the guys showed up. Um, and just a bunch of guys going for a swim at Mitchell's Bay. Uh, this woman down here is. Typically, of, of all of the buildings that were built during World War II to house troops, to house prisoners of war, uh, to house Japanese Canadians or anybody else, uh, the host was the, uh, this one happens to be uh, from the um, Olette farm. Uh, and Olette was also like the, uh, uh, like the best fairgrounds. He was, he had a nice pasture across from his house, but he's been eating well. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and up until about, I haven't been out there for a while, but about three years ago was the last time I went by, and you can still see the pump. There's no pump there, there's all gone. The only building, uh, the one that was at Valletta, is at uh, up the road about 20 miles from Valletta, and they've added an addition onto it. But it's the last one, the uh, French. What is it called now? 641. The one that still on William Street. It's made out of two of the same buildings. Um, they were out at number 10 basic, number 12 basic training camp on uh, where the Kinsman Auditorium was uh, during the war. Uh, but that was, they were sitting at one end, pitching at the other end, open space in their common space in the middle uh, for about 30 guys. And they worked all over. They didn't. So the funny thing about it was uh, they didn't do an awful lot of this. <laughs> they did some, but most of them were picking uh, fruit, uh, onions, any other kind of cash crops that were going around. Um, and they were very good. And, and, and most of them, almost all of them, men, I ended up in trouble. Uh, the uh, English family used to go down to the Royal Winter Fair um, and uh, they kept track of them. Uh, they, they would check in on the boys and see how they were doing it. They, they, were, uh, they were generally accepted all over. It was the only, the only place they ever had to call the police. Uh, this was kind of funny, was the, was the week after all of the uh, boys arrived at, at Dresden. And uh, it wasn't that the boys were doing anything, they were, getting, they were having a problem with traffic. People driving around and around and around, uh, uh, fascinated by these strange looking people that came from the East Coast. 
you know, it's, we, have to, we have to think this. We, we, we say, well, that's so silly now, but again, there was only 132 Japanese Canadians in Ontario at the time. It was a horrible thing that we did. Um, we've gotten a lot better. Uh, most of all that people owned in British Columbia was gone by the time they got back, or they got there at all. Um, properties were sold for next to nothing. Farms, this guy's farm was sold next to nothing. Um, boats were taken in well, 1,100 boats on a 13 in one day. Uh, they were either they were either sunk or sold or used by somebody else. So uh, they, there was no really reason to return to British Columbia. A lot of people didn't, uh, and and we're much the better for it. Um, were they ever compensated? Pardon? Were they ever compensated? No. Oh, yes. yes. Uh, in 19. For the compensation. 88, yes. Yeah. Wasn't that Trudeau? Yeah. It officially apologized yeah. and paid the, the, the people. It, it was. Some money, some but, kind of money. It wasn't yeah. enough. No, no, never is. No, twenty-four thousand. Yeah, about thirty. About thirty thousand. So I don't even think it was that high. How much? Twenty-one thousand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was one of our more despicable areas. Yeah. Dealing with folks, particularly people who had nothing. There, they, there was never one case brought up in the whole term of the war involving Japanese Canadian for espionage or spying. I mean, they they did round up. I have to say, they did round up Italians uh, at the start of the war. Uh, they did round up Germans at the start of the war. Uh, there was a German riot. In, or an anti German riot in, in Berlin, uh, down in Kitchener Waterloo, uh, in World War I. Uh, that's why they changed the name of the city. That's why they, that's why they call it Kitchener. Uh, but uh, there, was, there was no reason to do what they did, other than the Americans were rounding up their Japanese Canadians, and I guess the Ottawa thought, well, there's not going to be a possible do it too. Any other questions? Um, and again, I think this piece of wood, I, I think of this quite often that something so simple as a piece of wood has so much to do with somebody's life. Yeah. And I have to admire the man for the strength of looking that thing around. <laughs> Can I ask how how did you uh, were tra transported? Were you on a train? Were you, you know, how, how did they get you from the West Coast? Most of the folks across. We came on the train. Mm -hmm. It was a special train. We regularly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a super day longer. <laughs> better than a better than a, a cattle car. My friend says, "Well, but I, I mean, I my, I can remember my dad telling me the, the only time he was home during World War One, he was actually dropped off in Vancouver. He took a train." From uh, Vancouver to Chatham and then on to, to Halifax to catch the Little Mary to go back to England. And, and he said it was something out of the 1890s. <laughs> and he said, but it, it didn't matter. And he, that was all that there was. So he just went and took it away. Yeah, yeah. And now, what does the number mean on the on the box? Is that their family allotted number? That was every every. Every citizen had a every Japanese citizen had a, an identification number. Didn't tattoo it on them. At least they didn't do that. Yeah. Well, that was one good thing. Yeah. But there were some striking similarities at times. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
they still stay here. And he said he's a hell of a, a, of a, 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 a poker player. <laughs> and he said, the other guys, we come back and he could have more money. <laughs> and then I would say, that's how he survived. And we never, we never worked the day that they, they went up to the fields. You know, so would stay at the camp and, and then they come back and we play poker at night. He's like, money. <laughs> Research in World War One, uh, and I thought, well, this guy had to be really old. <laughs> I, I happened to find a, a fellow who was, uh, he lived just down the, the next farm up, and he said, half of the time the guy was asleep and his bed was so rested, he never would have fired anybody. <laughs> now, and the thing that I thought was really interesting about the email wrote us, and this is this as it involves the Japanese bank. Um, they wanted to know if they could go in Japanese tongue uh, in their bar or in their uh, garage. And uh, Howard uh, said, uh, yeah, sure, why not? Uh, so uh, uh, he, he supplied them with some wood and uh, I don't know if they have a stove like your dad did, because that's what we had in the basement, right? Is that the stove was still open and the box was firing up the hot water for his uh, uh, plunge bath in the basin. Uh, but these guys did the same. And apparently, after they, and it, this was in Howard's diary, after they, they were done their uh, uh, time in the bathtub, uh, they used to like air dry. This is fine. Pulled all the window shades down, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny. Anyways, anyway, just one other observation with him. So, Brees, I remember during the war, uh, a Japanese family working for the Fletcher family in concession. So, Brees, close to Fletcher, and they came to Cooper School, so section number three middle. So, Brees, Kai and Hara family was the name of them. The family and one of the names was Daisy, but Daisy's no longer there. I don't know. That's all I can remember. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been really hard to track down any of the survivors of the camps around here. And Nancy and I tried to get in touch with a few of them, but never they either passed away or nobody knew where they were. And we, we just, uh, there weren't, I, I didn't have a lot of these. If you look at the book, there are. There are names of the guys, some of the names of the guys who were at the Edenville camp. Um, and uh, uh, we suspect that they, a lot of them went to, uh, up into Northern Ontario, the winter that um, uh, they closed all the other camps, because there was more money to be made out there than to and sitting around Edenville. And, and most, of the, most of the time, they, that's what they did. They'll uh, uh, in talking to the farmer uh, next door to uh, where the doorhouse is. He said, they didn't work that hard. And Howard, he, he drove him down and stopped her. His dad and Howard would sit in the bar and have a good to drink some whiskey during the daytime and watch your degrees to work. <laughs> so uh, it, it's too bad because it's a, it's a whole bunch of, you know, part of our history that really is never becoming in. Are there any records in the archives of Canada about uh, the family? No, I don't know. Uh, I, I suspect they were well documented enough that there are archive, should be archival information there. Uh, but I mean, you're talking about uh, 8,000 people. Pardon? I couldn't hear that question. No. Yeah, well, there, I don't know. There should be. Well, there must have been records for the, the thing out in, in the 
conversation, but he had moved it all up to the
and I was going to say, and our teacher said in over the 43 years that she has done research and has done family histories, she has never, ever encountered anything so precious as what Matsy shared. And coming together with a group of people who are interested and are willing to help you, that, like, like when Linda said, that was an honor that you brought that and were willing to share that with us as a, as a group. So thank you so much for doing that. Who did that originally? Do you know? Who, who prepared that? Did your father or mother do that? No, we came from Japan. They had the original one, so I thought it was going to be those thin, fragile paper. Yeah. But the one, uh, actually, uh, I, the one I have is a copy. So my cousin had done it. Yeah. The other day I was speaking with one of my cousin in Japan. And mm -hmm. She says the other cousin is really working on it, so don't worry. She <laughs> 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 I could read Japanese, but not these old Japanese characters. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe at one point in time when you have a little more information, you would come back and share everything with us maybe on your progress. So we'd love to hear how you make out. Any other questions or tidbits or before we start our social time? Well, thank you everybody for coming and uh, to the folks who are going to be watching this online. And as I mentioned before, we'll see you at March 2017 and we should be back in our regular room at that time. So thank you very much.